Good evening, and welcome to tonight's commemoration of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. I am Sarah Barron, University Librarian at Duquesne University, and it has been my pleasure to plan tonight's event with our co-sponsor, the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, led by Dr. Lauren Apter Barron's father, and with Dr. David Rosenberg, our guest speaker. Duquesne University is committed to excellence in liberal and professional education. We are committed to a profound concern for moral and spiritual values, maintaining an ecumenical atmosphere open to diversity and service to the church, the community, the nation and the world. Tonight's commemoration is an opportunity to come together and remember all of those killed in the Holocaust especially those from Amiens, France. The first part of our program will be the commemoration, followed by Dr. Rosenberg's presentation, questions and answers. You are invited to submit questions in the questions box on the webinar platform. We'll begin with a welcome from President Ken Gormley, the 13th president of Duquesne University. Thank you, Dr. Barron. On behalf of the entire Duquesne University community, I want to welcome all of you to this special interfaith commemoration. I want to extend a special thanks to Dr. Lauren Apter, Barron's father, director of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, the co-sponsor of this event, and to Rabbi Hazan Jeffrey Myers, Rabbi of Tree of Life, whom we're honored to have join us this evening. Thanks as well to Dr. Sarah Barron, our university librarian, Father Bill Christie, university chaplain and director of campus ministry, and to Shai Maharavi, president of our Duquesne University Hillel Jewish Student Organization. Finally, I want to extend a warm welcome and our deep gratitude to our keynote speaker, Dr. David Rosenberg, a renowned Pittsburgh-based archivist and scholar who will present his outstanding work the Making of Who is a Jew, A Tale of Two Cities, and the Challenges of Bringing a Troubling Holocaust History Home. In just a few weeks, Dr. Rosenberg will receive a Medal of Honor for this work, presented by the city of Amiens, France, where he conducted his research. And when you hear him speak this evening, you'll understand why this honor is so richly deserved. I realize that you're gathering virtually this evening, but I invite each of you to come to campus so you can explore Dr. Rosenberg's work in person, the project which sheds light on the tragic fate of the Jewish community in Amiens has been presented at venues throughout Western Pennsylvania and in France. We're honored that it will be on display free and open to the public on the fourth floor of Duquesne's Gumberg Library through February 4th. You don't want to miss this moving exhibition. I know you'll be further inspired to explore it personally once you've heard Dr. Rosenberg speak this evening. As we gather today to honor the memory of those who lost their lives in the Holocaust, we also take the time to reflect upon how we can work together to promote peace and justice throughout our world and to prevent such unfathomable acts of intolerance. As a united community, we can and we will continue to stand against hatred and bigotry and to promote a message of love, which ultimately triumphs over all. Thank you. I know that everyone will be moved and inspired by tonight's event. Good evening, and thank you for being part of our program this evening. I'm Lauren Barron's father. I'm director of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, and I am so grateful to Duquesne University and to Dr. Sarah Barron for all of her efforts to create a lovely, lovely program to mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, a little bit about this day. Um, International Holocaust Remembrance Day is a United Nations holiday. And it began in 2005. So this is a fairly recent international observance and it's held on January 27th. So technically tomorrow, which is the date when Auschwitz was liberated in 1945. Um, we received a question today at the Holocaust Center that 
really leads me to make a point of clarification about what International Holocaust Remembrance Day is and how it differs from Yom HaShoah, which is the Holocaust Remembrance Day that we mark usually in April, sometimes early May, which translate to, translates to Holocaust Remembrance Day. So you may think that these are the same commemorations. Uh, they're not. So I wanna just issue a little bit of a clarification. Um, Yom HaShoah, began in Israel. It takes place on the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and that day has taken on religious significance. So the question that we got was, why aren't there commemorations happening in synagogues on International Holocaust Remembrance Day? Um, the Holocaust Center's annual commemoration of Yom HaShoah concludes traditional prayers of mourning, and we light candles for the six million Jewish victims of the Holocaust. International Holocaust Remembrance Day is a more secular day of remembrance, where we remember all of the victims of the Nazis on the day when the Soviet Red Army um, liberated Auschwitz. So sometimes as our knowledge of the Holocaust fades, people think that the United States Army was there at the liberation of Auschwitz. It was in fact the Red Army. And um, this gets to the international nature of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is a day that the Holocaust Center began to mark with programming several years ago. And we made a point of making this a day when we shed light on the lesser known parts of the Holocaust. And that could mean that we're talking about victim groups that we don't talk about as much as we talk about the Nazi war against the Jews. Um, today, uh, we're going to hear from Dr. David Rosenberg, uh, my good friend, and his work epitomizes this idea of shedding light on histories that we don't really pay enough attention to. And in the case of his extensive decades long work in Amiens, a history that had been lost to the region where it happened. So he has restored the Jews of the Somme and we'll be hearing about them and about his work um, to our consciousness as people who care about what happened in the Holocaust and want to remember the victims at the same time that he has revived the conscience and awareness of the inhabitants of that region of France. So this day will be marked and is being marked now all over the world with ceremonies wherever there are United Nations sites. Um, two years ago, I witnessed one such commemoration in Geneva, Switzerland, although it's hard to imagine flying to Europe right now. Um, and that ceremony was secular. It was a secular ceremony. Um, international in nature, representatives from all over the world. Um, but tonight we're doing something different um, that is more fitting and we're introducing interfaith elements to this commemoration. Um, we're at Duquesne University on Zoom. We would be in person in other times. And I just wanna share on a personal note that um, Duquesne at a time when many of the universities around Pittsburgh imposed quotas on the number of Jewish students who could attend, Duquesne was open for Jewish students. And uh, this is close to my heart because my parents met in the cafeteria at Duquesne when they were students there in the late 1960s. So um, I have that amount of gratitude always uh, for your fine institution. Um, it is my pleasure now to introduce our next two speakers. And this is in the order in which they will appear. And this introduces the interfaith element of what we're doing this evening. Um, first, I will introduce Father William H. Christie. Um, he is priest, the director of the Spiritual, Spiritan Campus Ministry at Duquesne University. Father Bill holds a Master of Divinity degree from Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, where he concentrated in the World Mission Program of Studies. He served 15 years as a missionary in Tanzania and as a missionary to Northwestern Australia. In the outback, he served on three Aboriginal reserves, Another time I would love to hear more about this, what incredible experiences these sound like, my goodness. Um, after seven years in Australia, Father Bill again returned to Duquesne University where he engages in pastoral counseling and spiritual direction in addition to his other pastoral duties as university chaplain. And I will also introduce you all to Rabbi Hazen Jeffrey Myers. Rabbi Myers has served as the rabbi and cantor for the Tree of Life in Pittsburgh since the summer of 2017. Um, he moved to the city of Bridges after spending decades in ministry in New Jersey and Long Island. After the horrific morning of October 27, 2018, when a heavily armed gunman began a murderous rampage in the Tree of Life building, Rabbi Myers, who survived the attack, 
became the face of the tragedy, and he probably is known to many of you if you have not met him in person. Since then, Rabbi Myers has set about sending the key message that love is stronger than the H word. Um, he won't say the word. Indeed, he has eliminated it from his speech in honor of the 11 lives lost at the Tree of Life on October 27th. And um, it really is my honor to introduce the both of you and we'll come to you first, Father Bill. Thank you again, everyone for coming. Thank you, Lauren. Two years ago, uh, in January of 2020, there was a special commemoration for this Holocaust Memorial Day when it was the 75th anniversary of that liberation of Auschwitz. However, almost immediately the world's attention was ripped away as we began to hear the first whispers of a pandemic. And soon all much of what was said and commemorated was lost in the chaos of our shutdowns. But tonight I'd like to revisit just a few words. In January of uh, 2020, Pope Francis, on the day of the uh, Holocaust Memorial said, in the face of huge tragedy, this atrocity, this indifference is not admissible. And memory, memory is a must. If we lose memory, we destroy our future. May the anniversary of the unspeakable cruelty that humanity learned of 75 years ago serve as a summons to pause, to be still, and to remember. We need to do this, lest we become indifferent. It is troubling to see that in many parts of the world, an increase of selfishness and indifference, a lack of concern for others and the attitude that says, life is good for me. When things are go wrong, anger and malice are unleashed. This creates a fertile ground for all forms of factionalism and populism we see around us, where hatred quickly springs up. Even recently, we have re witnessed a barbaric resurgence in cases of anti-Semitism. Once more, Pope Francis said, I firmly condemn every form of anti-Semitism. My prayer tonight is a prayer that was offered that same year. It was a prayer that was authored by, in London, by the chief rabbi of, of London, uh, Ephraim Mervis, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, and the senior imam of the mosque of the Central Mosque of London, Koran Asi. They wrote, Loving God, we come to you with heavy hearts, remembering the six million Jewish souls murdered during the Holocaust in the horrors of that history, when so many groups were targeted because of their identity and in genocides which followed, we recognize destructive prejudices that drive people apart. Forgive us when we give space to fear, negativity and hatred of others simply because they are different from us. In the light of God, we see everyone as equally precious manifestations of the divine and can know the courage to face the darkness. Through our prayers and actions, help us to stand together with those who are suffering so that the light may banish all darkness. Love will prevail over hate and good will triumph over evil. Amen. Rabbi Myers. Thank you, Father Christie. I'm about to share with you two pieces of liturgy. The first one is known by the opening two words, Kel Malé. It's a memorial prayer that's recited at the death of a loved one, also recited during the course of the year when we have remembrance services to remember the loss of our loved ones. What makes this specific Kel Malé unique is that this is the one that is recited in memory of the six million Jews who perished during the Shoah. So it uses language that would not be used during the rest of the year as we reflect upon martyrdom and the loss of life. The text calls for those who have perished to be under the eternal protecting care of God 
and may their souls rest in peace. The second text is known in Hebrew as the Kaddish, the Mourner's Prayer, also known in some liturgies as the Doxology. What's unique about this text is that there is no mention of death. It reaffirms our firm belief in God, the greatness of God, and that God is there for us in all times. If you're able to rise, I ask you to now do so. El male rachamim shochem amamim ametzei menucham nechona tachad kanefe hashina b'malot. Kiroshi Utehorim Kesorakia Masirim Et Nishmod Kolachen no Bene Israel Anashi Nashim Metav Shenitifu Beshenet Neko Beshenisrofo Beshenergo Begone Eden Menu Hotha Anna Baal Horachamim Hastirem Beseter Kenafecha Leolamim Utsuror Pitsuror Rachaim Et Nishmotehem Adonai Unachalatam Vianuhu Mishalom Al Mishkevotem Venomar Amen. And now we recite the words of the Mourner's Kaddish on the next slide. Yet Kadal, Viet Kadash, Shemer Rava, Ve Alma Divra Hidwate, Viamlich Makute, Becha Yechon, Uviomechon, Uvecha Ye de Hol, Beit Yisrael, Ba Agala Uvisman Kari, Vimru, Amen. Yehe Shemer Rava Mevarach, Le Alam Ule Alme Almaya. Yit Parach, Viet Tabach, Viet Paar, Viet Romam, Viet Nase, Viet Tadar, Viet Tale, Viet Halal, Shemeid Gudisha Brihu, Le Ella Min Kol Berhata Vishirata, Tush Pechata Venechamata, Da Amiran Be Alma Vimru Amen. Yehe Shlama Raba Min Shemaya. Vichayim Alenu, Vial Kol Yisrael, Vimru Amen. O se shalom Yim Romav, Hu Yase Shalom, Alenu, Vial Kol Yisrael, Vimru Amen. You may be seated.
Monsieur le Préfet, my husband, Leon Luria, who came to France in 1898, voluntarily served in the French army during the war of 1914 to 1918, received a medical discharge for pulmonary emphysema, and obtained French citizenship in 1922, is, like me, of the Jewish religion. In fact, he is president of the Jewish community of Amiens and the Department of the Somme. This past June 17th, my husband was apprehended in Admiral Corbett Street by members of the Army of Occupation, who immediately had him locked up in the jail in Amiens after having pointed out to him that the badge imposed on the Jews was not sewn on his jacket and wasn't displayed in the way prescribed by the regulations. I have no doubt that the information that you can gather about him will show him to be an exemplary Frenchman, one who always scrupulously observes the laws of his adopted country. I will add that the acts of generosity shown by my husband toward all who have sought his assistance have earned him the respect of numerous persons not connected with the Jewish community. I beg, Monsieur le Préfet, to call your particular attention to the character of relatively minor of the infraction which is being charged against my husband. Please act so that my husband can resume his place in hearth and home among our children and myself. Very respectfully yours. Margaret Luria. My name is Shai Maravi, and I'm the student president of Hillel, the Jewish student organization on campus. I was born and raised in Israel and moved to Pittsburgh right before my freshman year of college. Growing up, I had the privilege of living Jewish life in Israel. Here in America, Jewish life is very different than the life I had in Israel. In Israel, the holidays and breaks are based on the Jewish calendar. In school, you celebrate the Jewish holidays, and even the curriculum is focused on Jewish history and, of course, the Holocaust. As you might have noticed, I use the word privilege. I use this word because until I moved to the U.S., I took my ability to live my life as a Jew for granted. Yes, in Israel, there are other issues and conflicts, but I never felt a threat because I was Jewish, something I can no, no longer attest to living here in America. Unfortunately, anti-Semitism is on the rise. In recent, in recent years, both in numbers and in severity, um, the anti-Semitic incidents are growing. According to the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh, since June of 2021, there has been 400% increase in anti-Semitic attacks worldwide. The rise in incidents is not just happening worldwide, but also increased in exponentially in our area. As a community that had lived through the Tree of Life strategy, it is imperative to take a stand against hate. As a leading Catholic university in our region, Duquesne University must be the forerunner of disavowing anti-Semitism, hate, crimes, and of course, propaganda, both on and off campus. I want to use this opportunity and ask the leader of our great university to adopt the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism as the university's official definition for anti-Semitism. This definition is recognized by more, than three, uh, by more than 30 countries, including the United States federal government and some states. After the Holocaust, the international community said, never again. Humanity vowed to never allow for the, atrocity of, for the atrocities of the Holocaust to happen again. But unfortunately, the same anti-Semitism that caused, that caused the Holocaust is what we're seeing today. Momentarily, I'll be introducing, introducing Dr. Rosenberg, who will be talking about his work and research concerning the Holocaust. This type of work that Dr. Rosenberg does is essential and will be used by generations to come. The reason Dr. Rosenberg's work is so important is because of the lack of knowledge people have on the Holocaust. According to NBC News, in a, world, in a nationwide survey that was conducted in 2020, 63% of those surveyed did not know that 6 million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. One out of 10 respondents did not recall ever hearing the term the Holocaust. And about 40,000 concentration camps and Gatos were founded uh, during World War II, though half of the respondents could not even name a single one. To commit to the pledge we made of never again, we must first commit to never forget. Thus, 
the work of Dr. Rosenberg will ensure we will never forget. Dr. Rosenberg received a PhD in European history from Yale University with a dissertation on Protestant movement in Am Amiens in the 16th century. After a decade long engagement with the particular city and its history, Dr. Rosenberg em embarked in 2011 on the study of faith of Jewish community, especially during the Shoah. As a byproduct of his research, Rosenberg consulted with the department, the departmental archives of some to enrich their holdings and digital representation of Jewish related materials. With daughter Lydia Rosenberg, Jared Miller, he created a website containing several hundred scans of original documents related to the Jews of some during the occupation with introductions in, in English. Dr. David Rosenberg is a recipient of the Medal of Honor from the city of Amiens for his outstanding work on the on history of the city and region. The mayor of Amiens, Bridget Fuhr, the president of Amiens Metropole, uh, Elaine Guest, will present the award virtually on February 8, 2022, with in-person celebration to follow after it is safe to travel. I want to uh, remind everyone that if you have any questions for David or any of our speakers, please enter them in the Q&A box. Please welcome Dr. David Rosenberg. Thank you very much, Shai, for that kind introduction and for your uh, brilliant observations to the journalists on, on numerous occasions. Uh, Father Bill, thank you. And Rabbi Myers, thank you very much for that moving um, ceremony for International Holocaust Remembrance Day. President Gormley, it is an honor to be able to present my exhibit at Duquesne University. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I had the pleasure of being on campus and working with Duquesne students and faculty before in my position as volunteer coordinator of the Pittsburgh Darfur Emergency Coalition. And I know that this university is steeped in core principles of respect for others. I would like to express my deep appreciation to university librarian, Dr. Sarah Barron, who kept the idea of this exhibit in her sights for a long time, and along with Tara Murky and others, worked to create a wonderful result. I would also like to thank Dr. Lauren Barron's father of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, co-sponsor of this event, for encouraging my project in so many ways. Thanks finally to Devant Dodson Rosenberg, Lydia Rosenberg and Jared Miller for their loving support of my efforts. My thoughts this evening cannot help but be with the Tree of Life victims and their families. My family were members of Tree of Life congregation from 1987 to 2007, and we attended services there often. Now for my formal presentation. The exhibit presented here is part of a multi-pronged initiative to bring to light the, light the lives and fates of the Jews in one French city, Amiens, and its region, the Department of the Somme, a district north of Paris in the period from 1940 to 1945, with the goal that their experiences should be acknowledged and not forgotten. Two intertwined histories are highlighted in the exhibit. One, the history proper of the Jews and Jewish community of the Somme during the occupation. And two, the development of an initiative from 2011 to the present to drive this history into awareness and recognition by governmental bodies, educational institutions, and citizenry in general, notably in the specific region where the history unfolded. Since we commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day, I have planned to speak particularly about the second point, the development of an initiative to drive the history into awareness and recognition, notably in France. My focus on Amiens and its region has its own history. I first came to this city of roughly 120,000, dominated by its magnificent 13th century Gothic Cathedral of Notre Dame, 
to study the development of the Protestant movement in the city during the 16th century. This was in 1973 for a dissertation in history presented to Yale University. The experience of living in the town and working in the archives with its beautiful and vivid manuscripts and making French friends inside and outside the historical profession gave me a lasting sense of connection with the place. It was for this reason that returning to Amiens after retirement to continue my research, I was suddenly taken with the desire to learn more about my co-religionists there. I had seen a plaque inside the synagogue of Amiens when I attended high holiday services in 1995. To our martyrs, it said, and there followed a list of 49 names of Jews of the sum, men, women, and children who had been deported to their deaths in the camps. About 15 years later in 2011, remembering the plaque and sensing a vacuum of knowledge and awareness around me when I visited, I decided to embark on this project as a duty to the departed and as I hoped, a contribution to the historical consciousness of the region. It was only in 2004, 70 years after the liberation, that the French first opened their World War II files for investigation. In 1993, when the files were not yet open, a journalist from the newspaper in Amiens complained about the inaccessibility of information regarding the major roundup of Jews in the Somme in January of 1944. But even when the archives were finally opened, significant gaps in the history remained, not perhaps always apparent to the few amateur researchers who were interested in the subject. In 2014, three years after I had started on the project, I was astonished to encounter a collection containing more than 34,000 pages of documents most originally from the files of the Prefect of the Somme, the French civil governor in the region, in the National Archives modern section in Paris. The records classified as collection AJ38 dealt mainly with numerous cases of state authorized appropriation of Jewish owned businesses and buildings, so-called economic Aryanization. But there were also files related to the full gamut of anti-Jewish measures during the first three years of the occupation. I found poignant letters written by the Jews of Amiens to the prefects seeking exemption from some of these measures. I also discovered the original register which Jewish heads of households were required to sign when they received their allotments of yellow star badges in June 1942. On the advice of Mr. Olivier de Solon, director of the archives in Amiens, I was able to purchase microfilm of this vast trove of documents from the National Archives and to study them on a microfilm reader at the Mount Lebanon Public Library. Armed as it were with totally new information, I was able to bring my findings in various ways to the attention of the folks in France. I wrote two articles which appeared in a local historical journal one on a previously unknown roundup of foreign Jews in the department in July, 1942, and another a detailed account of the imposition of the Yellow Star. The information was picked up by journalists from the regional newspapers. An annual public commemoration of the roundup of 1944 had been established in Amiens starting in 2014, and students from a local high school Lycée Louis Trillier read aloud from the newly rediscovered letters of Jews at this ceremony in 2016 and again in 2017. You heard one of them in the introduction, a uh, letter of Margaret Luria concerning her husband, Leon, the head of the Jewish community there. But more was to happen and needed to happen. It was greatly disturbing to me that such vital information as I had found had lain unknown or inaccessible to the citizens of Amiens and region in the archives in Paris. And I felt compelled to create a website which would make a sampling of important documents available. 
With the help of my daughter, Lydia Rosenberg, and her husband, Jared Miller, a rudimentary Jews of the Sum website was built and launched in July 2016. It initially received some limited attention in the US and France, but it wasn't until 2017 that an important next step was taken. And here is where starts to be adumbrated my presentation subtitle, A Tale of Two Cities. On July 31st, 2017, I took the train from Amiens to Paris and at the Memorial of the Shoah, France's Holocaust Museum, I discovered on microfilm a series of identification cards or fiches, which appeared to contain small passport sized photos of the Jews of the Somme in 1942. The images were dark, however, the face is hard to make out. I notified the National Archives, which held the originals. An obliging archivist, Miss Carolyn Piketty, made high quality photocopies of the fiches for me and mailed them in a package that was sitting on my desk at home when I returned from abroad. When I saw these copies and the faces, I knew the project was about to reach a new level. A friend at Temple Emanuel and fellow member of the Adult Education Committee, Penny Abrams, encouraged me to create an exhibit to be shown at the Temple Art Gallery. Lydia designed the panels and there was, a newspaper, there was newspaper coverage in the Jewish Chronicle and the Post-Gazette. I was surprised and gratified by the interest shown by the Pittsburgh community, both Jews and non-Jews. When I sent the newspaper articles to French friends and colleagues, it kickstarted some further action there. The creation of an exhibit in Pittsburgh on the Jews of Amiens and the Somme provided, I like to think, some pressure for emulation. In the summer of 2018, planning began on a French version of the exhibit. The university library at the University of Picardy agreed to host it. French friends and colleagues rose to the occasion by creating additional panels. An English language class at a local lycée, Lycée Robert de Luzarche, translated the original panels into French and the exhibit debuted in January 2019 with coverage in the regional newspaper, the Courrier Picard. Comments in the visitor guest book to the exhibit, French exhibit reflect some reactions. Anti-Semitism in France, as many know, is not a thing of the past and the relevance actualité of the exhibit was not lost on many of the attendees. A terrifying realism, one visitor commented. It happened in my street, the Rue de l'Escarpe, de la Contrescarpe, and in my village, Quevauvillé. It was yesterday, but also a bit today. Another visitor wrote, one is plunged back into the past thanks to these very concrete identification cards and official documents in a way that then brings us to the very concerning state of affairs today, a 69% rise in anti-Semitic acts in 2018 on French soil. This period of history seems so remote and at the same time so present. How is it possible? Why such implacable wickedness? There are no words. The mayor of Amiens, Bridget Fouré, wrote. After the French exhibit, there were other significant developments, including arguably the coup de grace. Starting in March 2019, the university made its exhibit panels available for borrowing by local French schools and other organizations. To date, three lycées and two colleges, high schools and middle schools, in the region have borrowed the exhibit panels. It is encouraging to see the younger generation of French students encountering the photographs and the words via the letters of Jews who had lived in their city and region, and also them, for them to see a warning message in the bureaucratic forms, the fingerprints, the special registration requirements for Jews that presaged disaster. On another front, I made available to the de departmental archives in Amiens digital scans of those 34,000 plus pages of documents which I had discovered at the National Archives in Paris. 
the departmental archives then worked out an agreement with the national archives, permitting them to mount the images on an internal network in the departmental archives reading room. This astounding repatriation of the prefect's wartime files was heralded in the French newspaper. Meanwhile, back in the States, the US version of Who is a Jew traveled from Temple Emmanuel to the Holocaust Center and then to the University of Pittsburgh Hillman Library where Dr. Sarah Barron first saw it. And now fortunately in an expanded version to Duquesne. The coup de grace I refer to, however, was none of these excellent developments. Instead, on Father's Day in 2020, Lydia surprised me by putting who is a Jew in the American version online on the site of Jews of the Sum. That was the blow, you might say, that broke open the proverbial pinata and then released this project into the air, chiefly in the US and France, but in other countries as well. I was particularly encouraged to see, thanks to the analytics function of the web host, the extent to which users, not identified individually, of course, were logging onto the site from small towns and villages in the sum, as well as from Amiens. We added some additional material in French on the pages for the roundups of 1942 and 1944, since these events showed a high level of interest among French users. Bringing the exhibit to Duquesne, I felt challenged to say something about the role of the church. On the one hand, the sources I have largely relied on do not really offer a great deal of information on the subject. And I prefer not to try and approach such a complex issue with a few conclusions picked up from others. I will be inspired by this occasion, perhaps, to learn more and express it in time. I did make a note of one point I wish to raise. When the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ controversially hit the screens in 2004, I decided to help organize a colloquium in Pittsburgh of leading biblical scholars of different faiths to talk about the movie and some fundamental problems of historical and theological perspective. One session during the weekend was held at Duquesne. Among the distinguished scholars was Sister Mary C. Boyce, a professor at Union Theological Seminary. I have her book on my shelves. She writes of the, church, the church's teaching of contempt toward Jews and Judaism, a problem that I know has been fruitfully addressed in certain ways in recent years but not so much as to say all is well. Sister Boys writes of the counterpoint in Christian thought and medieval iconography between ecclesia, church, and synagogue, synagogue. It was a theory that endured for long centuries and may still persist in the minds of many. It is this, the theory which Sister Boys calls supersessionism, that the church replaced the synagogue and that the latter is dead letter. On the facade of medieval cathedrals like the one in French Strasbourg, synagogue is represented as a blindfolded female figure, head bowed, the tablets of the law seeming to slip from her grasp. Dr. Boyce's book by contrast is titled, Has God Only One Blessing? Judaism as a Source of Christian Self-Understanding. While we struggle with legacies such as these, may I also make one further point. Holocaust education is studiedly apolitical, but we are seeing a rise in white nationalism, notwithstanding the important efforts of educators. In my opinion, institutions as well as independent citizens must be challenged to talk more about the political roots of intolerance. Hitler did not come about only because of the kind of long-standing bias Dr. Boyce illuminates, but also because of the weakness and then collapse of democratic institutions. I would again like to thank Sarah Barron and Duquesne University for their marvelous work in expanding and presenting the current exhibit of Who is a Jew? It is still on view at the Gumberg Library fourth floor 
through February 4th. Dr. Barron and I have decided it might be of interest now to present a selection of slides which illustrate some of the points made in the preceding presentation. We will move through these hopefully with some rapidity and with brief comments. Thank you. Shifting gears too. Okay, the first slide um, you're looking at shows the uh, Cathedral of Notre Dame uh, in Amiens, the iconic uh, landmark um, structure. And you can see it the way it dominates the entire, um, the entire uh, landscape. And um, just it's, it's been designated as a UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site and is the leading you know, tourist attraction in modern days as it was a leading pilgrimage site in the Middle Ages. But you can see the size of the buildings around it and, uh, and how, uh, how, uh, how it dwarfs them. Um, this uh, shows the cathedral from on a ground level and uh, uh, flanking me there at some point or other when I hadn't lost so much weight is um, uh, my my uh, my former landlords when I came there to do my dissertation Pierre and Guy Tangiro uh, Pierre passed away this this past year uh, we became good friends um, all of us over the years almost 50 years uh, so next slide please this is uh, approximately in the same location as uh, Pierre Gaetan and me but it's uh, a squadron of German uh, anti-aircraft um, of a German anti-aircraft, uh, German anti-aircraft squ squadron uh, parading past the Cathedral of Amiens in May of 1942, about the same time that the fiches were made. Um, the outside of the cathedral has been buttressed um, to protect against uh, bombing damage. Next slide. This is what I referred to during my talk as the pla memorial plaque in the synagogue uh, listing the 49 um, individuals who were deported to their deaths. Uh, and that was the starting point for my uh, investigations. So uh, I began uh, looking into the matter seriously during my retirement in 2011, um, being able to go over summers to, to Amiens and Paris and dig around. And um, I saw a YouTube a presentation on, on, uh, on the internet while I was over there. And um, it mentioned this collection of AJ-38 at the National Archives. So uh, in three uh, exhilarating uh, and dismaying days, I went to the National Archives where I began to look into this vast trove of material. That's the reflecting pool. Uh, here's um, uh, among the uh, among the materials that I found there were these letters. Um, I mentioned those too. This is um, a letter of a barber, um, a Jewish immigrant from Poland, about uh, 38 years old, named Abraham Lewenberg. Uh, he and his wife, Sarah, had come to Amiens and he was a barber's assistant. Um, so in 1941, the Germans decided uh, as part of their sort of rolling marginalization of the Jewish population uh, to uh, forbid Jews from engaging in any occupations that had that caused them to come into contact with the public. Well, naturally the barber was uh, implicated by that. And he uh, wrote a letter to the prefect, the governor and explained that uh, the police had just informed him of the text of this ordinance uh, he's been a hairdresser assistant for 25 years. He's evidently in contact with the public and therefore comes under this, um, this restriction. He says, the only trade I know and my health does not permit me to under undertake, um, this is the only trade I know and my health does not permit me to undertake jobs requiring manual strength. I have stomach ulcers and I'm under a doctor's care. Excuse me a second. 
I have a son age nine and a half years old born in France who will require treatment as well. I appeal to you, this is the French official there, to intercede with the German authorities to allow me to exercise my trade at Mr. Rossigny's until improvements in my health will permit me to exercise another trade. This is just one of many letters um, I discovered of Jews writing in their own hands seeking exemption from some of these uh, um, absurd and uh, cruel restrictions. This is the uh, register that Jews were required to sign when they picked up their yellow stars. Um, the same stars were distributed you know, throughout France and um, each person over the age of six was required to wear the star and stars in public, um, size of a palm over their hearts. And uh, when they came, the heads of households came to pick up the stars at the police um, office in Amiens, um, police department in Amiens, and you can see their signatures there alongside. Go to page two now. Next, next slide. And um, if you look down um, to the third uh, person to sign there, um, that would be our, the barber, Mr. Lewenberg. So that was in, uh, in early June, 1942. He came and got nine, nine badges, nine yellow stars, three for himself, three for his wife, Sarah, and three for his uh, nine, 10 year old son, uh, Paul. Next slide, please. Next slide. Sarah, next slide. Yeah, so these then uh, were other documents that I found. Uh, this related to the roundup of foreign Jews that occurred in Amiens. Uh, in July, on July 18th and 19th, 1942. Uh, some people, some out there may know of the Veldiv roundup, the huge roundup that took place in Paris. Well, Amiens had a little, had its own, uh, and some department had its own sequel to that uh, a few days later. And this shows the names of the people that were rounded up. And again, we see, um, again, we see, um, Mr. Lewenberg there, the barber, number four on the list, oh no, number five on the list, and his wife, Sarah, number four. So they were rounded up on uh, July 18th and 19th and uh, were deported with the other people on this list to, uh, to well, were, 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 were sent by train and bus to Drancy, the camp for the Jews outside Paris, and then were put on a convoy, uh, headed for Auschwitz um, sometime later. Uh, his wife was hospitalized briefly, as was another woman on this list. But, um, but they, uh, when they got out of the hospital, uh, they were promptly uh, rounded up, uh, promptly taken into custody and sent to follow their husbands in the same fate. But their son escaped um, uh, arrest and wound up in Israel with his uncle later on. This is an example of uh, how the research that I did uh, and initially published in two scholarly, art, in two scholarly publications um, came out in the popular uh, press. Um, these it says these uh, victims of the sum of the roundup of, of the Veldiv roundup in July, 1942. An American historian has put in light the, uh, brought into light the impact of the Roundup of the Veldiv in Paris on three departments in Picardy. So that's that 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 immediately uh, channeled some of this consciousness to 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 the wider population. It was it was interesting, and I'm going to stop here for a second. It was interesting to me that uh, every year there's a commemoration all over France in different cities commemorating the Veldiv Roundup in Paris. But when I discovered these documents about what happened in Amiens, I thought to myself, well, you know, don't just talk about something that happened over there in the capital, uh, terrible actions of the French police uh, cooperating with the Germans. 
Um, uh, let's talk about uh, you know what what's happened right here with you. Okay. So next slide, please. Next next one. Sarah, next slide, please. Okay. All right, this is the, um, okay, this is the, that was the reading room of the Holocaust Memorial in Paris. Um, behind, behind on the left, uh, you can see the uh, microfilm readers where I saw the affiches in their darkened images. Next slide, please. Next slide. Sorry. Take it, take it to the next slide, please. Yes. This is the fiche of the barber, Abraham Lewenberg. No, uh, let's go back to the slide, please. Go back to the slide. You see that, um, well, you can see from reading this that he was, he was not able to uh, uh, con continue his trade as a barber. He turned into a night watchman. Um, and the word interne is written there. That means he's been uh, sent to Drancy and is on his way to Auschwitz. Next, next two slides, please. Margaret Luria, um, that was the letter that was read. Um, and Leon Luria, um, uh, he was imprisoned in du uh, the Citadel of Doulon for not wearing his yellow star in the prescribed manner. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, with all this information, I was able to, Lydia's help to create a, uh, an exhibit at the Tree of Life Synagogue. And these are um, folks looking at the slides over here. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. All right, so then uh, as I mentioned, we were able to get the, the uh, exhibit um, produced in Amiens itself. And here's, here are, here, here it is at the University of Picardy. Next slide. The next few slides relate to that. Uh, I found a document which uh, was a, a kind of minutes of a meeting of the uh, French civilians and government officials who, who were in charge of uh, Aryan confiscating Jewish property. And uh, it was look, it was written out as a as if it were a little play with different speakers. And so I thought, well, that'd be great to have a skit produced. And in fact, this is a drama club at the University of Picardy enacting this little little found play where the um, French civilians and the German and French authorities uh, quibble over. Uh, things like, well, what if the Jew doesn't want to sell and things like that. It's, it's, it's extremely uh, grim and uh, but yet revealing. Uh, next slides, please. Next. Oh, that's the audience um, uh, wa watching the performance. These are um, high school students in Amiens looking at the exhibit just as the Students here at Duquesne might be looking at theirs. Next, they're looking at the French exhibit. Here are students doing an exercise based on the fiches that their teacher has, has provided for them. It was very moving to see that. Next slide, please. Um, I think we'll, um, th th this was an interesting case. I talked about it in a series of, oops. Um, I, I, I talked about the case of Rachel Hubolt, uh, born Zinman, uh, in a series of um, conversations I did with the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. You can go on their Facebook or, uh, or um, um, uh, YouTube channel and, and listen to them. Um, anyway, Rachel Zinman was uh, baptized as a Catholic after her marriage. And, uh, and tried to uh, get some exemption from being deported in 1944. Uh, she was described as a Jew, but Catholic, Juive mais Catholique, and that stuck in my head. Uh, that church you saw there was the church she was baptized in. And then the next slide uh, shows uh, her feast at Drancy camp, where she 
apparently didn't succeed in, in getting exempt because of her Catholic baptism and attempted to maintain that she was only half Jewish, which would have exempted her. But um, that didn't work either. And she was in fact deported. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, this is a family um, from uh, Poland, Polish Jews in Amiens. Uh, the father, the, the husband and wife are uh, in the center of the picture. Um, and then on the left, you see, you see our friend, the barber, Abraham Lewenberg, his wife, Sarah, and their son, Paul. Uh, this is taken in the 1930s. Uh, the, the, the groom here uh, was deported. Abraham was deported. Sarah was deported. And as I mentioned, Paul was, was saved. Um, yeah, next slide. Next slide. Hello? Can you get the next slide on, please? Yeah, that's the same family, the, the husband and wife that married in Amiens in the 30s. They had a son, Victor, um, that's them in Paris with their yellow, yellow stars. Um, I seem to be, my, my, my connection seems to be a little unstable. Next, next slide, please. Yeah, this is the, uh, this is the, the two statues that were outside the Strasbourg Cathedral. Uh, one is the, uh, uh, the church on the left, church tri triumphant, you might say, and the other is the uh, synagogue uh, superseded, you might say, that I, I mentioned earlier, blindfolded and with the tables of the law slipping from a grasp. Next slide, please. Next slide. Can we have the next slide, please? Yeah, uh, believe it or not, in 1970, um, the, the, the flyer that was just, uh, that just flashed over the screen there. In 1970, there was something called the rumor of Amiens. And um, uh, according to this uh, urban, uh, 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 urban uh, I don't know, urban tale, uh, Jews were engaged in the white, Jewish businessmen were engaged in the white slave trade of Christian women. Uh, when women went into their the dressing room to try on their cl uh, clothes, the, uh, the, the trap door uh, suddenly opened and um, uh, the, uh, and dropped the, the woman down into a series of underground uh, tunnels where they were promptly whisked away to uh, North Africa. Uh, and, and, and sold on the slave and slave markets. Um, well, uh, needless to say, um, uh, there wasn't anything to this. And there were two, two cities in France where this occurred. The irony, of course, is, is Jewish businesses that were uh, essentially despoiled, Aryanized during the war. And uh, the Jews were now blamed for something uh, totally outrageous. Uh, one woman, in fact, from Amiens was missing, but turned up later uh, when some excavation on a building in the city uh, went on and, and there was her body apparently done away with by somebody uh, who could have been a candidate for crime scene investigating, investigations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, persistence of anti-Semitism though, however, at a deep level. Um, next, next slide. Um, this shows me uh, at the dedication of a plaque at the site of the World War II synagogue. The, um, the collection I found at Paris helped flesh out the, what happened to the synagogue uh, during World War II. And there to my left is the mayor of Amiens who created uh, the plaque there. Uh, it, it recalls, the, it recalls the, the fact that there was a synagogue in the middle of town. Um, there's a commemoration, as I mentioned, every, Janu every year in January to commemorate the biggest roundup of Jews. Uh, these are government officials and others uh, at this ceremony this year on January 9th. Next slide. And they dedicated a new plaque to the memory of a young 
girl, actually a 14 year old girl who was deported from Amiens, another member of the Polish uh, Jewish contingent. Um, Cecile Redlick, the little girl shown playing the violin uh, and the street was named after her, the Rue Cecile Redlick. This was a result of uh, the, the um, researches of a retired a Catholic school teacher in Amiens, Mr. Claude Wattel. Uh, he was the one who, who first got interested in Cecile Redlich and her family and, and did all the research. So final uh, word, um, this is, uh, just wanted to call your attention to the fact that there's a lot of information and resources on the website, Jews of the Sum, and uh, including translated letters uh, of, of the, that are accompaniments to the exhibit. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up. That's some of these letters appear like that on the, uh, on the website, uh, the letter and then the, the thumbnail extracted from the fiches. Okay, that's, that, that concludes my presentation. And I think uh, it's time for a question and answer period at this point, if time permits. Thank you, David. We do have time for a couple of questions. We did just get one in the chat. The uh, Abitant de Amiens slide, which year was that? Say that again, please. The Abitant de Amiens. I believe that was the slide with the rumors. Do you oh, know what year that was? 1970. 1970. It was a Jewish student organization. The flyer was debunking the rumor. But it's it's if you if you search on rumor of Amiens or rumor of Amiens, there was one in Orléans too, um, uh, urban uh, urban uh, anti-Semitic, uh, you know, uh, story just like the Jews poisoning wells or using Christian babies' blood for to make their matzah in the Middle Ages. Um, these uh, undercurrents of uh, of anti-Semitism can crop up in unexpected and alarming ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We do have another question and here it is. How important was it for you to do research on the ground in Amiens as opposed to online since so much has been scanned and put online? Well, uh, not so much on this particular subject has been scanned and put online. And in fact, what has been is what I what I've done, so uh, it was very important. Uh, I mean, I, I I discovered all these things um, not online. Uh, in fact, um, you know, I uh, people didn't seem aware that this um, extremely important resource you know, was seventy miles away in the uh, National Archives in Paris. And in fact, um, the AJ thirty eight collection was originally in the records of the prefects in Amiens. And they were sent to Paris after the war. After the war, in order to centralize the, the process of restitution to the Jewish owners who had survived and, or their heirs and come back to claim their inheritance, the uh, French government, uh, uh, liberation government, asked the different um, departments to send their records. And we have, there's a, a shipment record of, uh, of when these thousands of pages of, of documents went to Paris, but um, I don't think before I started poking around. And it really, it really is, uh, it takes a while sometimes. Like I've been working on this for three years before I kind of stumbled on this. And, and, and yeah, you, you, you have to be on the ground um, or else it's not all online. <laughs> Thank you. We have a question from a student. As a public history student with an interest in archives, I'm wondering, are there any particular lessons that archivists or archival institutions can take from your experience uncovering and sharing these records of the Jews of Amiens? Well, uh, I mean, it, it's, it, it seems like people are really interested in, in this, in, in, you know, in encountering things themselves. I mean, sometimes the archives can act and they, they, they're wonderful at preserving things. Sometimes they're not um, 
not so strong in making things accessible. Uh, I, I found that out uh, as an archivist at Pitt and also, um, you know, in France, uh, there were all these, um, all these restrictions, these periods when you couldn't uh, have access, delays, of, they call them delay, delay de communicabilité, the, the lapse of time, that the, the time that has to elapse before uh, the archives can be open. That's why things weren't available till 2004, um, the World War II records. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it, it, it's, there are, the things to be learned are that, um, you know, make things accessible, try not to get in, in, the, in the way and, and put things out there. Cause um, you know, I, at, at Pitt, I had a chance to do another project that was similar to this on labor history of Western Pennsylvania. It's called Labor Legacy. And um, I, I, you know, we, among the things we put out for that was a list of 10,000 employees that worked at the National Tube Steelworks in 1940, in the 1940s. And there were all, once we put that online, all sorts of people got, wanted to get to it. So, um, you know, I think our archi archives are sort of torn between their, you know, proprietary interest in sort of unfolding, ceremonially unfolding what they have and the, uh, the uh, kind of the beauty of really putting material out there where people can, can have at it. Definitely. Well, one last question. This attendee was intrigued by the skit idea and the students who did the skit and also the exercises with the clipboards. Mm -hmm. And the person says, noticing the alarming anti-Semitism increase, I would like to see things like that here. Are you aware of anything like that in the Pittsburgh schools? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't know that there are a number of strong teachers interested in, in, in Holocaust education that work with the Holocaust Center here. Um, I think that, you know, lesson plans and can be derived from the fiches and, and, and other materials there. Um, and, you know, it, it, it kind of depends. I mean, there, the, the lending of the, the panels by the University of Picardy is a good idea, you know, they went around to five different high schools or middle schools, as I explained, and, uh, um, you know, so, and even without that, the onlining of the fiches makes it possible to, you know, do the same sorts of exercises, um, even without the physical panels. So it would be a, dis it would be a definite possibility, but I know that you know, the way curriculums, curricula are st structured. Um, my wife was a retired teacher and, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to uh, get um, other, you know, uh, other curricular ideas inserted into the, but I, I certainly think it, it would profit people to, to engage with this material. And the letters combined with the pictures, you know, give both voice and you know, I, 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 I thank you for that, that question. And, and what, one of the ways that the teachers were using it is, and, and the, that the students were reading them at, at commemorations is that I met with teachers there who were interested and, and, uh, and we worked together. I remember I had a delightful lunch with, with two, two teachers from this one lycée there. And um, we spent some time, and I spent some time listening to them reading the letters out loud while we, you know, kind of got interested in the students unfolding the history through plays. Wonderful. Well, David, thank you so much for answering those questions. We do have a few others that I will send you uh, after the session. So maybe you can respond to those on, um, on your website. We yeah. are going to wrap up. We're just a little bit over time. So we will wrap up. And uh, I'd like to thank, and I'm going to turn my camera on. <laughs> so thank you so much. Oh. Thank oh. you so much, uh, Dr. Rosenberg, Dr. Barron's father, Rabbi Myers, Father Christie, and Shai Ma'aravi. We also thank Professor Paul Miller for the beautiful music he recorded uh, just for this session. 
Um, we'd like to thank our marketing department, particularly Gabriel Payne and the events team, especially Michael Kozar for helping with the technical aspects of the program tonight. The exhibition Jews of Amiens is on display at Gumberg Library until February 4th. All are welcome. Finally, please take a moment to jot down this web address where you are invited to leave a reflection and feedback on the program. It's just three questions at bit.ly slash IHRD survey. We'll leave it up for just a moment before closing so you can make a note of it. Thank you again for joining us and have a good evening.